Thank you. Um, appreciate uh, an opportunity to speak here. I was actually in Australia in September um, to speak at a uh, biotech-related um, Australian international um, uh, convention, and I had the um, opportunity to uh, speak at the National Press Club here, which, if you're interested, is, is available on YouTube. But I did make a big faux pas. I, um, I uh, announced that I was a supporter of uh, uh, the Collingwood Magpies, and I really alienated a lot of the audience with that. So, I, so I, I'm f forewarned here, I already have my prejudices about uh, Australian League football. Um, I, I, I'm going to talk about um, uh, what we also call the food wars, which is um, the, the fight for modern agriculture. And I use the term precision agriculture um, here. Uh, because precision agriculture means not only the way you apply it in the horticultural industry, but it's also precision genetics and the way we're changing uh, foods, uh, crops, um, applying uh, biotechnology, mm, bi biotechnological solutions uh, to really change the way food is grown. And we're really facing an inflection point, literally, um, this year, the next year, on how these products will be regulated. I know you've heard a lot about the GMO debate, but a lot of those issues are kind of ingrained and the regulatory structure is set. But things are actually changing on a lot of these areas. I wanted to give you a tiny bit of background about me. As, I, as was said, I've been a journalist for 40, over 40 years, 20 years in, in uh, network television in the United States. If you're familiar with Tom Brokaw, he's a well-known announcer, uh, and I was his producer for many years, um, and then went into writing, focusing on sustainability and ultimately on genetics. Uh, written a couple of books on population genetics and uh, uh, a number of books also on agricultural issues. One on crop chemophobia, which talks about the crop protection industry, and my belief that um, a lot of the concerns about chemicals is uh, overblown. It's based on a misunderstanding of toxicity and how it affects humans and, and the environment and also a book on um, GMO technology. Uh, uh, obviously, these, these wars are still being fought over this. I have a, a, a website that's very well known. It's called the Genetic Literacy Project. We average about 15,000 hits a day. It covers both human and uh, agricultural issues. There's a conflation of those issues on certain things. Uh, uh, during this talk, I'm gonna be talking about new breeding technologies, the use of gene editing in the agricultural field. That, uh, that is actually ha occurring, it's the same techniques that are occurring in human genetics as well. In fact, just three days ago, the first uh, human trial on um, using gene editing to fight uh, some cancer, uh, some, to help some cancer patients was approved. First time ever, uh, and we see uh, gene editing happening in, in, in crops all the time, and there are forces aligned in our society that wanna stop this. Uh, stop experimentation, stop research, and attempting to demonize it, and there are many of the people that are, have been traditionally attacking conventional agriculture. And that's part of the um, issues that I'm gonna be raising today. I think there's a great myth um, created by a lot of critical NGOs of uh, conventional agriculture that um, the media uh, is somehow biased in favor of big ag, uh, that uh, all the politicians are on the take, um, corporate agricultural rules. Um, that may uh, be true in the minds of many critics but the reality of it suggests, looking at our regulatory structure, that in fact it's the critics of modern agriculture that hold sway in the media. Um, it doesn't take much to muck up the regulatory system and create precautionary doubt, um, even when the science is pretty clear, like it is on issues involving crop biotechnology. And they've really thrown a roadblock into a lot of innovation. Um, it's, you see that playing out very much in, in Australia. You um, go on the internet and you see images related to biotechnology, there's scare images. You just put in the word GMOs and Google and, and click on images and you don't get anything that, that looks like science. What you get are pictures like this, none of which are replicated in, 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 in the real scientific world and all of which scientists have attempted to dispel. But the, um, uh, the, uh, the beauty and the, and the problem with the internet is that it's very democratic and crap is list, listed as high as science. Um, I was just in a cab yesterday. Um, the cab driver was telling me that his Japanese wife um, is very much anti-GMO. And um, he says, and she re she's re read it on the internet. I mean, I, I know if you go to wehategmos.org and you believe that's as, just as important as the uh, food and, um, and agricultural uh, websites put out by the Australian government or the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, then you'll believe that, these, that there's a 50-50 debate on the 
um, safety and efficacy of these products. But that's unfortunately the environment that we operate in. It also determines and shapes the political environment. The, um, uh, the anti-modern uh, technology movement has really focused on defining agriculture as industrial agriculture. You've heard that term. You might even have embraced it yourself. But let's be clear, it's, an, it's a political term in the same way that GMO is a political term. GMO did not exist as a way to describe crop biotechnology 15 years ago. It was literally hatched as a word uh, to, I mean, as a, as a phrase, uh, because it had the word organism in it, because no one wants to eat food with organisms in it, do they? Um, and it actually has been very effective, uh, and so effective that I use it in my speeches, and, and the industry has incorporated that. But it's a real sign of how people who are opposed to technology and are trying to create misinformation or fear can actually change the entire narrative just by changing some of the words of the debate. And we see that going on all the time. Uh, industrial ag is one of those phrases. I would argue, um, and I think I'm gonna make this point today and also in a, in, a, in a speech tomorrow, is that conventional agriculture is actually more sustainable, um, more ecologically beneficial than organic agriculture. Uh, course, uh, when you look at a, a range of sustainability issues, from the inputs that go into it, um, to the um, use of uh, uh, which kinds of pesticides or insecticides you use. People who believe that organic farmers don't use pesticides or insecticides don't, don't understand how agriculture works. Pests don't disappear because you snap your fingers. Um, and if you look at a range of things, including yield, uh, which is a really major factor in the idea of, of, of crop lands, which have to, where you get crop lands to continue to feed people, well, you have to knock down forests. So there's a lot of sustainability issues in conventional agriculture. When you do a fair analysis, and many scientists have, not convincing to critics of it, um, really um, shows up very, very well. A lot of my work is trying to identify the role of NGOs uh, in uh, framing the debate over biotechnology. The people who read my the Genetic Literacy Project site, and I do a lot of outreach and training with um, scientists to how they can better communicate their views to the public, um, uh, in, involves trying to handle the ways, the narratives that are created by people who are critical of NGOs. If you look at this chart, um, I work with a company called Sigwatch, which is based in Germany. And they do, um, and they analyze uh, various sectors and what the issues are that nonprofits are going after targeting. Uh, you can see, obviously, energy is the single largest one, but the next largest category is food and agriculture. Um, and uh, you could see, as you might expect on almost all these issues, Europe tends to be the hot point for a lot of the debates over this. Europe is very precaution-minded. If you've not heard of the concept, the precautionary principle, I won't go into it in any detail now, but it's a, um, a notion, a philosophical idea that has become embedded in the science community to some degree, that we shouldn't take actions if we don't know the exact consequences of those actions. In fact, we never know the exact consequences of actions. Um, they, it skews cost-benefit analysis, and what it does is provide people who are critical of, of tech, technological advances um, a way to stop them, because it's actually been incorporated in a lot of scientific laws. But you could see that the, um, uh, the, the, the food sector, the agricultural sector, has, is heavily targeted and remains so. Um, I've been doing tracking over the years since the 1990s about how the biotech debate has played out. Uh, the blue is Europe, the red is uh, North America, uh, Asia Pacific would, would include um, Australia. Obviously, you guys haven't had it, um, nearly the vocal, uh, partly because of population, but it's just not uh, as debated an issue. The spike in, the, in 1998 was um, uh, when Australia and Europe were debating their first um, labeling laws, uh, when some of the initial products were being introduced, and a huge hysteria and disinformation campaign went on. Um, it's, it's abated since then, and then you see the bump up in January of 09. That was the B scare um, that persists today, and they claim that, um, uh, first the claim was GMOs kill bees, which is obviously, has GMOs are not a thing, GMOs are a process, so GMOs can't kill bees, but that was claimed. And then there's the neonicotinoid um, scare, which uh, persists today, and we're facing um, uh, the ban, I mean, it's, it's been essentially a two-year moratorium has been, uh, in place in Europe. Uh, so you can see those are the spikes, but it has been r relatively stable for about the, the past 10 years. Um, a lot of the issues originally on GMOs focused around health and safety issues. You might be familiar with a 
French scientist by the name of Gilles Eric Serlini, who's a well-known um, uh, activist scientist. He's funded by the organic industry. You can look at his funding. It's, um, it's, it's funny when, when a uh, scientist is shown to have gotten some funding or maybe done a public speech uh, on behalf of industry, and sometimes not funded at all, but done a speech, their, 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 their research is, is uh, uh, characterized as, uh, as being unreliable. They're accused of being shills. Serlini's work has been um, uh, largely funded by the organic industry for years, and Greenpeace and others. He's very, very political. And he, uh, a, a, a study he put out a few years ago that was published in a very um, uh, reputable journal uh, had pictures, grotesque pictures of rats tortured apparently by uh, uh, GMOs and glyphosate. Um, what later came out uh, was, or actually it emerged almost uh, uh, immediately when scientists had a chance to scrutinize the papers, but the, the rats that were used, it's called a Sprague Dolly variety, and, and they are prone to, to, um, to uh, these kinds of tumors. They're bred to be that way. They're fast growing as a way to help scientists examine the um, problems that come up when, uh, when new products are introduced. And in fact, the, the, the ones who were not fed GMOs um, had the exact same tumors. But that's not the pictures that he selected, and that's not what the press put out. With a year um, after his paper was put out, a little less than a year, it was retracted because of methodological and other problems. He couldn't get it republished, so he found what's called a pay-for-play uh, pay journal, a journal in which he paid to get his, um, uh, to get his paper published. It was not peer-reviewed, but it's back on the internet with all these pictures, and um, there are still huge complaints uh, by uh, activists claiming, look, there's the Serlini, these rats, these shows that these problems, but that's not what the science community thinks. There's been uh, 275 global in independent agencies that have put out statements uh, about the safety of GMOs, uh, and the, basically the, the, the standard observation is that uh, the uh, products that come from uh, GMO seeds are no more harmful uh, than standard products that you get from conventional breeding or, or from organics, and that the sustainability advantages are actually uh, uh, there for uh, GM products, in, including the European Food Safety Commission, the European Commission, which alone um, authorized more than 200 studies. Just a couple of months ago, the largest study in history was released by the National Academies in the United States. The 11th, for the 11th time, they've, reinfor they've reaffirmed the safety of GM crops. Uh, they looked at all kinds of things, autism, um, cancer-related issues, all these claims that you see all through the internet and the people will claim to you in conversations their fears of that. None of them held up. They did comparisons of, of studies of people of, of these various disease rates in the United States and countries um, that have not had GM crops and there's absolutely no difference in those kinds of things. They did find an interesting correlation between the rise in autism and the consumption of organic foods in the United States, but they think it's just correlation, not causation. But it shows you how easy it is to take correlations that appear like they're meaningful and twist them uh, to make a political argument. Um, although the debate over GM safety is pretty much over, uh, and it's been trending that way for the past two years, the anti-GMO community and the anti-modern agricultural community has shifted their emphasis. You may see it here, I'm not sure, in Australia. It's very evident in Europe and the United States, away from targeting GMOs because they can't argue the safety issue anymore. So they're using proxies for it. And the two proxies are glyphosate and chemicals in general and ne neonicotinoids, claiming that they are very, very problematic. And you could see very dramatically um, uh, how these issues have played out. Again, uh, January 2009 uh, is when um, a lot of the B issues began coming out, and some articles began coming out on that in some peer-reviewed journals, and that was a heightened interest, and also in North America as well. And then you see a new spike in January uh, 15, uh, and that was in early 2015, and that was when an agency of the United Nations put out a uh, hazard assessment study claiming that glyphosate may cause cancer. They also said that meat may cause cancer, and sunlight may cause cancer, and coffee does cause cancer. Um, but these were hazard assessments. Anything could cause cancer. Um, there's been assessments by dozens and dozens of agencies, including every European agency and, and four other agencies from the World Health Organization, all of which um, have said that glyphosate, which is one of the most effective and mildest herbicides that uh, 
that has ever been found um, is perfectly safe, but it was used by anti-GMO NGOs who are also anti-chemical, who are also anti-modern technology, who are also anti-modern farming, um, to try to increase the heat and increase the regulatory issues. Um, they use very popular MEMS. Monsanto is the classic one. Monsanto is the devil. Um, and and the, um, uh, the, what, what the, uh, the fight is really, they say, between modern agriculture and organics. People have a uh, very touchy-feely um, uh, view of organics, the natural alternative industry of various kinds, whether it's uh, uh, health products or agricultural products, food. And basically, uh, the organic industry, for better or for worse, now I'm not trying to demonize organic farmers. We have some who write for the Genetic Literacy Project, but they believe in coexistence and they believe in science. But there's an element within the organic community who has ridden the fear and misperceptions about modern agriculture, concerns about pesticides, and create a huge market at great expense, turning out largely substandard products that offer no health benefits. Um, and I think that's a, a, a really a questionable situation that we face in modern farming today. Um, there are some real, real concerns um, because of the demonization that the organic industry has, has brought. And believe me, it, it, I, I, again, I, I know that there are issues here in Australia. It's very, very, I'm just giving you some examples in the United States. There's a guy named Andrew Kimbrell, happens to be a lawyer, runs an organization called the Center for Food Safety, which is the, the largest agency, NGO in the world, um, uh, as a source for legal challenges of, of uh, biotechnology and modern farming. So they go in and they act as consultants or they file briefs in states around the United States. They've, they've worked overseas. Um, they sponsor a woman named Vandana Shiva, who's a uh, Indian activist. Uh, science, she claims she's a scientist, she's a philosopher, demonizes modern agriculture, calls the Green Revolution of an utter failure, but has single-handedly blocked uh, the introduction of a lot of technology in Asia and elsewhere. Um, but you can see that what, what, what is so interesting about his statement, he's not, he's not saying a genetically engineered um, corn might be dangerous. He's not saying a genetically engineered tomato might be dangerous. He's saying genetic en engineering is dangerous. Well, I want to make this point and underscore it. In the United States, in Canada, we have product-based um, regulations, meaning Every product is evaluated on its own merits. It's not a great system. It's still many, antiquated in many ways. But no one is regulating genetic engineering. They're regulating the individual product. Here in Australia and in Europe and in many other places, you have process. So genetic engineering is essentially what is considered questionable and, and, and spurs regulations. That is the inflection point going on when we're, when we're gonna move into the next section of the talk in a, in a minute, talking about new breeding technologies. Because the question is, are they gonna fall under the antiquated system of process regulation that Australia and Europe has, or are they gonna fall under product regulation where these new products that are, that are coming out, particularly in the agricultural sector, might be evaluated on their own merits? Um, Anti-GMO's annual budget exceeds uh, US $15 billion in the United States, the organic, um, um, the organic community, the organic um, uh, expenditures uh, worldwide is about $135 billion. The seed industry is about $35 billion. So the organic industry is huge. Don't let anyone kid you. Um, I, I want to also make it clear that the real battle is over the issue of sustainability going forward. You in the, in the, in the agricultural community, um, uh, have to focus, I believe, on making sure that the products that you are turning out and the way you talk about that product is framed in the way that politicians and the popular media talk about these issues. And sustainability is the key issue. This is a, uh, again, work, working with SIGWATCH, uh, looking at the major issues that, uh, that are targeted by NGOs, and biodiversity is the single, second most important issue worldwide whether they're talking about energy or whether they're talking about agriculture. Everything is formed around the concept of biodiversity, which is another one of these code names for sustainability issues. Um, and, and modern agriculture is, is, uh, is, is attacked for supposedly uh, producing monocultures, which challenge biodiversity. The National Academies of Sciences in the U.S. actually addressed that in their report and said that uh, from, from their research, GMOs actually have increased biodiversity in a lot of ways. There absolutely is some monocultural issues 
uh, in, in agriculture that have to be addressed. But that, the, the, the real battleground is going to be on this issue of biodiversity and sustainability going forward. So, you, so whenever the discussions come up, it has to be framed around that. I can't underscore enough. I don't want to say that organi the organic industry is the energy, uh, the, the e enemy of conventional agriculture, but there are elements of it that, that, that suggest that that is true, that they would like nothing better than for people to perceive um, crop protection as an, an unnecessary evil, not a necessary part of, of, uh, uh, of what we need to produce an abundant food supply. Um, and it's the primary gr growth drivers in all the campaigns that, that I've been able to see and been able to monitor. And the focus is on pesticides, hormones, antibiotics, and GMOs. Uh, the major breeding techniques um, conventional breeding uh, has been going on for 10,000 years. Anybody who says, oh, I want to only have food from nature, if they only had food from nature, their corn would be uh, little black nubs that, crack, that would crack your teeth. Um, uh, I think a lot of you uh, are, are growing things like broccoli or kale or cabbage or Brussels sprouts. All of those derive from um, a mustard weed that was inedible. Um, not too long ago, and every one of those are just variations on that. So the, the, there is no natural food. All we have is man-made food. The question is, what kinds of processes are, do we deem acceptable and which ones are not? So we have conventional breeding, then we have mutagenesis. Um, just a quick hand, does, uh, is, who is familiar with the term mutagenesis? Only a, a handful. Mutagenesis is a breeding technique that was developed in the 1930s, uh, by which you subject seeds to either um, radiation, because the beginning of the uh, understanding of how radiation works, or um, chemicals, and in both cases, they literally blew out the chromosomes of the seeds, created random mutations, and over a period of four, five, six years, many times you develop traits. You'd find traits that would, make, that would improve a product. So how many of you here have eaten sweet red grapefruits? So anybody here? Is that's not a common thing that people have had, sweet red grapefruits? Uh, really uh, high-end Italian pasta? Is, uh, I'm sure everyone's gone to a nice Italian restaurant. Both of those products were made through mutagenesis. Took six years in a laboratory to develop the uh, ruby red grapefruit, the Rio grapefruit. Um, over um, 2,000 um, experiments blasting out the chromosomes randomly with the hope that something would come about. Those products are now sold as organic products, even though you had these random, lab-created, white coat scientists doing these kinds of things. Um, it's pretty bizarre when you think about it, uh, but the, that their embrace is organic, and we have more than 3,000 foods uh, and ornamental plants and other things that were created through the process of mutagenesis, none of which would, would seem, uh, you, you'd, you'd think if they were concerned, they meaning the protesters were concerned about the potential dangers of random problems caused by um, manipulating nature that, that blasting um, products with, with radiation or dousing them in chemicals would be something that would be on their radar. But that's not what they're after. They're after bi biotechnology specifically. They're not after concern about change because if they were, they would be ch talking about these things in a different kind of way. RNA interference is just one of the many techniques of, of, GNA, of um, genetic engineering, which we'll talk about. It's very, very common uh, now. Uh, I'll discuss it in a few minutes, but there's a, a number of products that have been introduced in the United States um, that have kind of snuck under the, um, under the uh, uh, covers of, of the, some of the regulation that exists, including an apple known as the Arctic apple. Uh, you're all familiar with, Cis is it Cicero, C-S-I-R-O, here in Australia, developed the Arctic apple, uh, the, the, the developed the, um, the original um, uh, 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 coating for that, and it was then uh, bought out, uh, or the technology was bought by a Canadian company, and for less than $5 million, they developed an apple that doesn't brown, or browns much more slowly, and uh, apples turn brown not because they're going bad initially, it's because of an enzymatic reaction. They just took, knocked out the gene with RNA interference so it doesn't go brown as fast, saving enormous amount of waste. And it was approved in the United States and approved in Canada and is going on sale. So that's one gene editing technique and we'll talk about some more. And then of course we have transgenics. And transgenics has been the focal point of GMO uh, activism and also legislation because of, mostly because of the concept of so-called foreign genes. You move a gene from one product into another. The, uh, that's, that's the whole concept of Frankensteinian foods, Frankenfoods and so forth over the foreign gene things. 
Mutation breeding, as I, as I explained, very, very common. It's, it's led to the seedless grapefruit and other seedless fruits. Um, the pear on the right is called an Oso pear, which is a Japanese pear. It's delicious, created through mutation breeding. Took about four years in laboratory um, testing. M many of the mints that we eat are created through mutation breeding, commonly used throughout the world. And interestingly enough, we even have a, a, a type of wheat called Clearfield wheat, which was developed through mutation breeding, which is herbicide resistant, much like the GMO wheat um, uh, that's been developed by Monsanto and others, Roundup Ready crops that are herbicide tolerant. This is an herbicide tolerant Clearfield wheat developed by Mutagenesis. It's okay uh, if it's done through Mutagenesis. It's not okay if it was done through GMOs. They have the same resistance problems that you see uh, developing with glyphosate um, in, in Clearfield wheat, but again, it's got a, an okay purely because it's mutagenesis. The, the new age of 2.0 we're coming into um, focuses on different kinds of products and different kind of processes. Some are transgenic. Uh, GMO golden rice is a transgenic example. Um, so the, it does use a foreign gene and um, has been the uh, uh, central focus of a lot of NGO activists. It's been delayed for a number of technical reasons that it's difficult to go into right now. You can see the activists there, they're Greenpeace activists, trashing fields in, um, in, uh, uh, in, in the Philippines. We have a number of other products that have been developed um, that are both traditional and non-traditional. For instance, pluots, you can develop through conventional breeding, uh, but then you have uh, 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 developed but unapproved things like um, plums that are uh, virus resistant. These are not laboratory experiments. These are actually developed. They've been grown. The only thing that's stopping them from being introduced is regulations that have been developed around GMOs. We see it in the root vegetables. Rainbow carrots have been developed. An amazing thing to conventional breeding. That's considered okay. But we have disease-resistant cassava that's been developed not by Monsanto or DuPont scientists, but by the governments working with local scientists in Africa, unapproved because of hysteria created by GMO activists. We have GMO bacterial fighting bananas that have been uh, developed, again, resistance uh, to this issue. GMO diabetes fighting lettuce, again, developed resistance to this from anti-GMO activists. Regulatory pathways are unclear. These things sit in limbo. Um, what will break this impasse on a lot of these products? And that's what's the NBTs. I mentioned already RNA interference is one example. Um, they use things called talons. I won't get into that right now to explain it. It's a little too complicated. Um, it's a, it is a complicated technique, but it, it is easily doable. And the, um, again, the developers of Arctic Apple, uh, which you see here on the, on the left, uh, the Arctic Apple that doesn't brown uh, as quickly, uh, work within the uh, genome of, of the actual apple itself, didn't bring any foreign genes in, and was able, using talons, um, a certain kind of gene editing uh, capability to create an apple that's now approved in, uh, in the United States and in Canada. The, one of the other major things that ha has been approved and sailed through the regulatory system is a, uh, the, what's called the innate potato, Simplot, which has a presence here in Australia. Uh, it's a non-browning uh, disease resistant, it's, it's resistant to the Irish blight, which is still common in the United States and Europe and elsewhere. Uh, disease resistant, and it doesn't brown as quickly. The wastage savings alone from that is absolutely amazing. Um, anti GMOers campaign against this as Franken foods. No transgenics, but they're trying to uh, apply the same kind of um, uh, concerns about it. There are sustainability benefits, that's the key, and I want to keep going back to that. The, the new, these new innovations are not just helping farmers, as if helping farmers is a bad thing because those, um, those benefits are passed on to consumers, but they also clearly help consumers. Um, the innate potato doesn't need any additional pesticides or treatments, so it cuts down on inputs. The sequence added isn't from a virus or bacteria. That's the transgenic issue that crosses the species barrier. It doesn't have the whole Monsanto Association. You can't demonize it as a... Uh, a, a, a product of, of, of big ag, and it doesn't have DNA sequences for antibiotic resistance, and it addresses genuine health concerns that some have, like it reduces the acrylamide in our diet, um, which you get from fr frying um, potatoes. If you fry these potatoes, acrylamide doesn't develop. So, um, you know, activists have been 
nuts against campaigning against McDonald's and organizations like that because of acrylamide in the potatoes. Here they have a potato that you can make the same thing without acrylamide in it. They don't say boo, they don't support it. You'd think that they would embrace it because it actually addresses one of their major health problems, but that hasn't happened. The major new innovations, though, are, are in broader applications of gene editing around the CRISPR editing system. It's, it's, it's easier than talons, and uh, the only way I can describe it is it's similar to editing a Word document. You literally take sections of the genome out and you move it from one place to the other. You don't move it from one species to another. You operate within the species itself. So there's no foreign DNA. And there's, uh, there's no plant pests such as viruses or bacteria, which is used to introduce DNA into uh, transgenic um, foods. Uh, they're not really pests, uh, but that's the, the words that is, is, is often used. NBTs have real sustainability benefits. For instance, they've come up, come up with a wheat where they can, uh, some wheats have been developed over the centuries uh, that have lost many of their protective properties. Uh, they, they are very weak and they need er certain kinds of um, pesticides sprayed on them because they've lost the natural protections that nature has built in with them. That's just the nature of what the happens over breeding. Well, they found out ways through gene editing to reintroduce the lost pesticide protections from the wild and the innovation will actually lead to a dramatic decrease in the use of pesticides in certain wheat varieties. They have this also in vegetables as well. And um, a dramatic, just through, through using gene editing, decreased pesticide use and the anti-GMO activists, you'd think they'd embrace that wholeheartedly. Instead, they portray this as a Franken food. Um, the, the situation is somewhat optimistic on the gene editing front. In the United States, the, the first CRISPR edited crops, and those, that's, I, I mentioned two of them, uh, the Arctic apple and the Simplot innate potato presented to the U.S. regulatory system, were allowed to be cultivated and sold without oversight by the U.S. Department of Agriculture in April. Um, that was a dramatic increase. These, uh, some of these have been presented to um, uh, food standards, Australia and New Zealand, and a, a very positive ruling came out um, a few years ago. Food derived from plants modified using ZFN1 and ZFN2. That's th those are scientific words for the talons that I was talking about. It's a type of gene editing would be similar to food produced using traditional mutagenic techniques and should therefore not be regarded as GM food. As you can imagine, the anti-GMO community is furious at this because, again, they're targeting the technology. They don't want to see technological improvement. They want to send us back to an age where organics is the only way we do things. We have an organic experiment going on right now in global agriculture. It's called Africa, and it's not doing very well. We need to use modern technological techniques to, um, to challenge what's going on. Doesn't mean there's certain aspects of organic agriculture and agro ecological agriculture that aren't helpful, but organics alone is not going to do it. So they've launched a, um, a campaign against GMOs. Greenpeace has been at the center of it. New GMA foods could end up on your plate untested and unlabeled, but in fact, as um, uh, all the Australian and New Zealand officials have said, they're, they're regular foods. There's nothing really to test here, and they've been approved in the United States as well. And they're doing things like picturing babies because the same technique can be used to alter human DNA. They therefore are morphing together the fear of designer babies with crops just to create fear. And make no mistake about it, the uh, Australian NGOs have, have, are targeting gene editing. It is their single biggest um, issue going forward. Uh, no question about it. And this is a, basically we need a paradigm shift when it comes to agriculture in Australia. Uh, focusing on agro, uh, a move away from the chemical treadmill, and they basically accuse these crops of being part of a chemical treadmill, when just the opposite is the case. They are, being, they are ways to actually reduce inputs in chemicals, but it is Friends of the Earth has targeted gene editing. So the question going forward is, we, you, as a the modern agricultural community, I think has to try to keep a, a sharp eye on the issues of where regulation is going, and also focus your argument going forward on issues of um, how to make sure that the new gene editing revolution that's coming upon us is not regulated um, and, and, and essentially put out of business the way GMOs have been. Thank you.